Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. This is our continuation of History 102, the world from 1500 to 2000. And we start with a Cook's tour of the world of 1450, the players in the 102 game. We call it a Cook's tour. That's a little old fashioned, but it goes back to Thomas Cook, kind of the inventor of modern tourism, modern travels. Uh, the Thomas Cook Company, which just filed for bankruptcy, I think, in England. They had their own airline. Uh, created itineraries. And then the hotels that you would stay in, and it would be part of a grand tour that you could go and see things all over the world. And it tells you something about the wealth of of the English gentry, of the English middle and upper classes, that they could do this. But it was a way, it's kind of like cruise ships today. Everything was kind of self-contained so that you you could trust from from the moment you left, your you walked out your door, what you would see, where you would stay, what you would eat, and that it would be fine. You'd have, you'd pay money for this. You'd pay more money than if you just, like, Bilbo Baggins just left your house and went walking around the world, but it was also safer. And so we call it a cook's tour, this itinerary. And we're really talking about the players of the game. Don't hate the player, hate the game. And the 102 game, as we talked about, is ruling the world. So, the cook's tour of the world of 1450. We start in the Americas. We have two major empires, the Aztecs in central Mexico and the Incas along the Andean Ridge, this, this spit of land between the sea and the 10,000-foot peaks of the Andeans, Andean mountains. But we also have a major culture in the Yucatan in Central America. That's the, what's left over of the Mayan civilization, which is an old civilization, an ancient civilization. But the states failed. For a variety of reasons, some a bit with climate change, some with movements of nomadic peoples, and they failed around 1000 AD. This civilization's still around, but the great states, the great empires are gone. Uh, the Mayans will be kind of the, the, uh, the basis for the Spanish stories of the seven cities of gold, the lost cities of gold. Uh, that's the idea that there's cities in the jungle that have been reclaimed by the jungle that, like, if you could find the ruins, there's gold in there. That's the Mayans. So we have two major empires. We have a major culture. We also have, in the Caribbean, we have a major culture, the Arawak, or what the Spanish will call the Caribs, where we get the Caribbean. And they are the Caribbean and the South American coast. So they are a seaborne people, who move and trade from the South American coast throughout the Caribbean islands. What all these are are sophisticated cultures, but they lacked domesticated animals and thus efficient farming. They don't have, they didn't bring with them during the Ice Age, they couldn't bring with them in the Ice Age, large beasts of burden. First, they hadn't been domesticated. Second, you couldn't feed them in the Ice Age across the Ice Bridge. So, and the Americas just didn't have any. The closest you get is the llama, the alpaca, um, which are, you can't put a plow on. And so, all of farming had to be done by hand, by person. I mean, you could make tools, but you, you lost the animal labor that made farming in Africa, in the Fertile Crescent, in Europe, in Asia, much more efficient. They don't have naval technology other than the Caribs and the Arawak. Uh, they're trading ships, but they don't have, they can't cross an ocean. They don't have oceanic trade. And they don't have a global unity to conquer the world, nor do they even know the world is out there. They know their trade networks are out there. They know about the Western Americas, the Western Hemisphere, and the peoples and the movements. There is trade that goes all the way up through what is modern Canada and all the way down across the Isthmus of Panama and down through the Incas. But there is no knowledge of 
and Eastern Hemisphere. So, um, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Caribs, the Mayans, they are not going to conquer the world. In fact, they're going to be destroyed by it. What about North America? Well, we get lots of small groups and confederation. That equals war and trade. This is pretty much basic forest plains nomadic folk. We see this in, in Central Asia. We, we've talked, if you took my 102 class, we talked about these people, these kinds of peoples all the time. Uh, they're hunter-gatherer, light farming, some herding, seasonal movements. You know, pretty, they, they, there's not a, they, they don't have the animal power to do, I'm going to farm 100 acres of land. So there's, you know, movement from place to place looking for better places to, grow, to gather food, better hunting, where they is uh, more efficient herding. The forests, and North America is very forested, equals protection. The plains equal movement. The rivers were highways. And the rivers allow for trade because there are no horses to the 1500s. So you can't go kind of east to west and west to east. You have to kind of follow the Mississippi, go north to south. You have to follow the rivers. There is one major city for a while. Cahokia. It's a mound city on the Mississippi. And it had some 20,000 people, which is large. London was smaller. Paris was smaller during the Middle Ages. But the size and the diversity of the geography, plus the lack of domesticated animals, plus the lack of oceanic naval technology means they're not able to conquer the world. Okay. What about Ming China? They overthrew the Mongol Yuan dynasty. They created China for the Chinese, what I'm going to end up calling a small China, because China goes through different stages, and there's a big China where China absorbs lots of non-Han peoples, the peoples that are not, quote, Chinese, though that's in and of itself an identity that we have to talk about when we talk about the chapters. But when we talk about Ch when as a American, when you think of Chinese, you're thinking of Han, Han Chinese. But there are lots of minority groups that are also Chinese. So you have to remember that what the Ming wanted was a China for the Han, a China for the Chinese. The Yuan dynasty was the Mongol dynasty. And that was big China. It was super huge China. It was like China for all the people of East Asia, of which the Han were not even the most important group, which you could understand if you're Han and you're living and your, your homeland has been conquered by foreigners, you're not so happy about. Well, the Ming are going to build the Great Wall. They're going to they're gonna end uh, Zheng He's naval expedition that we'll, we'll talk about, which will go throughout the Indian Ocean, even all the way to Africa. Uh, the Han mandarins will defeat the Muslim eunuchs for control of the government and control of the emperor. And basically what we see during the Ming dynasty is a China closing itself off from the world. It is going to be one of the great powers. Every kind of section we talk about, will we will talk about China. But it is clearly uninterested in conquering the world mostly because it had been abused by the yuan. It just didn't want to deal with the world. It wanted to shut the world out and just stay home, which I totally understand. You don't want to get into fights. You don't want to deal with other people. You just, you just want to do your own thing and be left the F alone. So the Ming are clearly in protective mode. They're, they are one of the great powers. They are big. They are wealthy. They are one of the largest populations of any, they are the largest population of any country in the world. They, they are as big as all of Europe. They are rich. They are successful. But they are also clearly uninterested in conquering the world. In the, and clearly uninterested really in the rest of the world, which will be part of their undoing.
What about Mongol Central Asia? The, the Genghis Khan successor states. Well, they're smashed by Mongolian civil wars. This part of the Silk Road that connects China to the Middle East and Europe is smashed. Tamerlanes or Timur's wars to reunite Genghis Khan's empire just smash it again. The Silk Road cities are looted and ruined. And then the Ming start closing off trade. So they're not even allowed to recover because the trade that they rely on is starting to dry up. And so Central Asia gets poor. And if you think about the poorest places in the world, many of you will go, oh, that's Africa. It's actually going to be Central Asia, which is one of the richest places in the world. For most of human history, Central Asia is one of the great highways connecting empires together. And all of those cities, Samarkand and Merv and Herat, were massively wealthy cities. Because remember what taxes were in the ancient world. It was sales tax. So every time merchants along the Silk Road sold something, the local government got about 10%, which everyone was cool with. Why? Because they just jacked up the price, 10%. The consumer got what they wanted. And remember, Central Asia is not the land for the consumption. So they don't mind what they're paying because they're just going to pass on the price as they sell it along. The real, the consumer is the Europeans and to a lesser extent, the Islamic world. And so those are the people who will be paying the price. So the cities of Central Asia are rich. But if you think of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan today, these are not wealthy places unless they have oil, unless they have natural gas. But they're all landlocked. They have potential. I mean, Afghanistan has the problem with Afghanistan is it's had 40 years of war. But Afghanistan has always been and we're going to talk about Afghanistan over and over and over and over again as the birthplace of empires. There's a book called like the it's a it, it, it's the graveyard of empires good title completely wrong afghanistan's not the graveyard of empires it's written like america's invaded afghanistan and look at what happened to the russians and it's like well one that's not understanding soviet history correctly and two it's like the british lost one battle there and then conquered half of it so they didn't the british empire didn't die like it's alexander conquered it, it took him two years granted but he conquered the hell out of it. Alexander conquered Afghanistan, what we will call Afghanistan, it's Bactria back then, so well that the Greeks that lived there became a giant empire. We're going to talk about Babur. We're going to talk about Mahmud. We're going to talk about empire after empire and after empire that starts in what we call Afghanistan. That's not a poor place. That's not a place that's the graveyard of empires. It's the birthplace of empires. Every time, and that book was like popular for like five years and it drove me nuts. Because every time I would have to explain to students, like, it's wrong. It's completely wrong. The title is, it's a sexy title. It's completely wrong. Because we're going to see empire after empire after empire come out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a land of wealth. It's a trade route plus a granary. It's green. It's only the devastation of the last 40 years of continuous warfare that has turned Afghanistan into this terrible place. And to a less extent, to exactly what made it poor was the end of the Silk Road. The Mongol Civil Wars we're going to talk about. So once the crossroads of trade and the womb of great empires, which we just talked about, it becomes a wasteland of poverty. Tamerlane's death means that Central Asia will not unite China to the Middle East. So Tamerlane is the last chance of creating a giant empire, stretching, uh, replacing Gen Genghis Khan's empire that stretches from the Mediterranean to the Pacific. His death 
plus his destruction of basically everything. But his death meant that this chance of creating a united Asian empire, united Roman empire that stretched from uh, Constantinople to uh, Beijing and across the Himalayas to Delhi was not going to happen. And so without that unity, without that trade, without that economic success, Central Asia will break apart into smaller and smaller units that will continue to fight each other. And those units will then either be absorbed by um, larger empires of the Ottomans or the Persians or the Mughals or Qing China or um, will just or eventually the Russians as well or will just limp along as small impoverished um, princelings. All right, India, quote unquote, and in the, India is going to be a problem because I, uh, I don't know really what to call it. There's Hindustan, but that's not the whole thing. When I talk about India, I mean from the Indus to Bengal, from the Himalayas to the sea, the British Raj, and there's a lot of different names for that. Um. It's not modern India. It includes Nepal, includes Bhutan, it includes um, modern Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan. It includes uh, modern India and, and Bangladesh and even Sri Lanka. There, the subcontinent is the best way of discussing it. And there's many peoples and many cultures and many languages but for lack of a better way of t- 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 telling it, I will use end up falling into the Anglo-American traditional usage of India. The land of the Indus and the Ganges and the Deccan Plateau. India is smashed by Tamiling. Now, this is northern India. Tamerlane never gets to southern India, and we'll talk about that when we hit, talk about India. It's invaded by Islamic Turkish-speaking tribes from what we will now call Afghanistan, but it's called various different things. Uh, many of them will be based out of the capital city of what is Afghanistan today, Kabul. Uh, it is a massive subcontinent, and it's just too diverse geographically or culturally to control. Islamic success in the north equaled the conversion of the trade hubs, the Indus River and the Ganges estuary what we now to call Pakistan and Bangladesh. But the massive Hindu interior was never tied very well to Islamic trade. The Ganges is, the Ganges flows into, across northern India into Bengal, and thus to trade in the um, eastern Indian Ocean and like Indonesia. But there's a whole lot of India that's not tied to international trade, not tied to the Silk Roads. And so it's so large that it even could assimilate the conquerors. There's so many people, second only to China. It's so big an economy, second, again, only to China. But again, unlike China, that's a unified under the Ming and then the Qing, India is very rarely unified. We'll talk about the times that it is, And it's at those points, you kind of get a flexing of some economic muscle, but it's kind of like Germany in the 19th century. India is, its divisions hide its strengths. The Himalayas are so big, you know, Mount Everest is 29,000 feet, that makes India hard to be conquered. Like, the Mongols don't come there. Tamerlane will, but the original Mongols don't come. They don't hang a left, cross over the Hindu Kush into India. They just keep on trucking to to the Middle East. Most conquerors do. So this makes India very hard to conquer because it's it's separated from all of the major highways of Central Asia. But the big question is: can India be united? 
for India to conquer the world, for India to impose a Islamic or Hindu subcontinental political, cultural effect on the world, it needs to unite its political and cultural world somehow. And the question is, can it? Can it do so before someone else comes and conquers India? The answer usually is it can't. That's a historical answer. Whether it's the Aryans, whether it is the uh, Persians, Alexander, um, the Greco-Bactrians, Mahmud, or Babur, is there is someone coming from Tamerlane, coming from the outside, that will either smash Indian unity or take all of its parts, smush it together, and use it to make themselves rich. What about Southeast Asia? Well, like West Africa, lots of diverse cultures, lots of hard terrain. Expansion is very difficult. They are tied to trade between India, which is gets smashed from time to time, and Ming, China, which is turning inward. So you could see that they're going to have fiscal issues. If they're relying on trade from two partners and those partners are in economic depressions, and this is especially true for the Islamic states in Indonesia and the southern Philippines, um, you can understand that in Southeast Asia, where is the money going to come from to create the culture, to create the empire, to create the armies, to create the government, to create the art and the books and the literature. Where is this money coming from? If the two places that are the origins of that, of that trade cannot fulfill their role in global trade. So what happens is you get competition for who controls those trade routes and who controls the peasant workers. Because without those trade routes, or if as those trade routes dry up, who controls the peasant workers becomes even more important. And so you get the Thai and the Viet and the Cambodian wars over who will control these territories in what we will call Southeast Asia. South of Ming China, east of Bengal. Moving west to the Ottoman Turks. United the Turks of Asia Minor, the Ottoman Turks, I'm sorry, the Ottoman Turks are the tribe that unites the Turks of Asia Minor after the Mongolian disaster. They will replace the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, in the Eastern Mediterranean and at the crossroads of the tra trading world. They will learn to build what starts as a homogeneous Turkish kingdom, will, they will learn to build a multi-ethnic empire of Europeans, Christians, Greeks, Arabs, Turks, Persians, um, Armenians, Caucasian peoples, the peoples of the Caucasus, right? the tribes of Arabia, even Africans. They will win the competition in the Islamic world of post Tamerlane's Persia. They have competition with, with Persia. They'll at least neutralize. They'll never conquer Persia, but they'll at least neutralize it as a competitor. They will conquer Mamluk Egypt. They will conquer southeastern Slavic Europe. And they'll get all the way to the gates of Vienna twice. There's the grand prize of Constantinople, the last part of the Roman Empire. They will get that too. That, that is now Istanbul. And there's a song that Istanbul is Constantinople. And Istanbul is Constantinople. And why did Constantinople get the work? Works? It's nobody's business but the Turks. They will have diversity, gunpowder. They are the crossroads of Asia, Europe, Africa. And they have the trade income and weak competition. The Turks might just conquer the world like Alexander the Romans before them. They have the potential. They have the potential to go from India to the Atlantic. Twice they'll get to Germany. So 
So we'll have to talk about them. What about Islamic African kingdoms? These are rich, sophisticated. They are tied to the Islamic world. They are long part of the European and Arabic trade routes. But in West Africa, the weak leaders after Mansa Musa led the kingdom of Mali to break up. Songhai, the great military empire, uh, lasts for two generations and then civil wars within the royal dynasty break it, begin to break it up and a Moroccan invasion from across the desert breaks up Songhai completely. West Africa is rich, but too diverse to unite in order to conquer North Africa, and it's too dependent on Islamic wealth for its success. Following the, 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 the end of the Silk Road, Tamerlane's destruction of what's left of the, uh, the Mongol destruction of the Silk Road, Tamerlane's destruction of what's left of the Silk Road, as the Islamic world got poorer, so did Western Africa. And so does Eastern Africa. Why? Because East Africa has these small coastal trading kingdoms. They are one third of the Indian Oceanic trade system. They trade with India and Arabia. And there's a triangle trade. Just like there's a triangle trade between Europe, West Africa, and the Americas. And they are a major component of that. But they are small and divided cities or princelings. And as India gets poorer, or the Islamic world gets poorer, East Africa gets poorer as well. Until the Europeans show up and redirect East African trade away from India, away from Arabia, and to Europe, to making Europeans rich. And so the African kingdoms are too diverse, too small. In East Africa, they're too small. And in West Africa, they're too diverse and too, both, in both cases, reliant on the trade with peoples who are, all, who are dying, with kingdoms that are dying. So they simply will lack the size and the scale for sub-Saharan African kingdoms to rule the world. What about Europe? Well, Europe looks like Southeast Asia and West Africa. There's too many cultures, languages, and diversity of geography to unite e easily. In fact, they will never unite. They will continue to murder each other in one of the themes of our course. Well into 1945. So for 500 years, white Europeans will murder other white Europeans. It is an absolute mess. The end of the Byzantine Empire allowed the Islamic Turkish invasion of the Southeast. The Catholic success in Islamic Iberia created Portugal and Spain as independent states, but they were too poor from war to do much about it. England has its civil wars. France has recovery from the Hundred Years' War it fought with England, and it needs to still unite what we would have called Gaul and turn it into France. There's Burgundy, there's Brittany, there's all of these parts that we today call France that weren't part of France in 1400, 1450. And certainly they're not Frenchmen. They're not f French. They're something else. France needs to turn them into Frenchmen. The Holy Roman Empire, what is today a large part of Germany, is an absolute mess. It's an empire, quote unquote, but the emperor doesn't really control it. It's divided into 300 plus independent dukedoms. See India. So how are you going to unite that? You have Slavic Europe, which is, quote, barely European, according to the Catholic West. The Catholic West, Spain, Portugal, France, England, Germany, don't consider Slavic Europe, Russia, even though it's Catholic, Poland, and much less the Balkans, including Romania and Bulgaria and the Serbs and the Croats, even though the Croats are also Catholic, but they're not even, they're barely European. They have lots of land, they have lots of people, but they have weak states. Someone has to replace the Byzantine Orthodox leadership. Whom? But whom? Now, the answer, you know, the Tocqueville tells you who the answer is, but that wasn't necessarily known in 1450. The end of the Silk Road trade equaled trouble for Italy, long the richest part of Europe. 
It's a crisis for kings needing tax income. The markets want Chinese and Indian goods, spices from the from Indonesia, tea, coffee from Arabia, silks, manu porcelain manufactured goods. How are you going to get it? The Silk Road, the traditional trade route is drying up. Do you go by sea? Do you sail to China? How? How on earth are you going to do that? No one knows what the oceans are like. No one even has the technology. So then why, by 1900, do the Europeans, who were such a mess in 1400, why do Europeans and their cultural allies, the United States, Australia, and Canada, the Anglo, what's called the Anglo-American world, why do their cultural allies, whether they're European or European descendants, conquer the world, control 85% of the world by 1900? Why is time in Christian years and in Roman months why is English and French the languages of education and culture? They're the, they're the official languages of the UN, not Mandarin, which more people in the world speak. Not Hindi, English and French. Why are Europeans, their technology, their guns, their religion, everywhere transforming the world? Why do people of South Asia play cricket? Why does everyone in the world play some form of football, i.e. soccer? How do these yahoos who murder each other in such numbers for such dumb reasons as who has a better version of the same God? How do they dominate the globe? And then having dominated the globe, then murder each other in even more staggering numbers. How is that possible? That is the course we're going to talk about. So we're going to start in part one, going around the world and talking about our different cultures. And then we're going to come back to Europe and talk about the Europeans and why, why, why. And how they create this European dominated world, how the Europeans, how white people conquer the world. And what does that mean for everybody? Because the white people along the way are going to create racism. They're going to invent racism. They're going to commit genocide. They're going to commit massive levels of slavery. That even slave states previously, ancient slave states, would balk at. They will create science and the enlightenment. Da Vinci and Michelangelo. And Cyclone B. And the flamethrower. And the nuclear bomb. How? Why? Because we're still dealing with this today. We're still dealing in a world that is dominated by the Anglo-European cultural world. Now, China is rising. The wealth of China, modern China. India, with its 1.5 billion people, might also. We're going to talk about both of them. And maybe in 100 years, maybe in less. I mean, if you watch the fall, if you know the fallout mo uh, movies, fallout games, you know that there's a giant nuclear war between China and the United States. There was an apocalyptic show, British show where the first episode ends with Donald Trump nuking China and starting a nuclear war. So, we have to talk about how the world becomes the world. And that's what we're going to end up with. So thank you. Be safe. Take care. See you in the next episode.